Coming up on DTNS, do you need a grocery concierge and a robot? Don't answer too quickly. Plus, Patrick Norton is here to update us on the right to repair and why the future of Facebook is the metaverse. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 23rd, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Somewhere deep in St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Ah, we were just talking about uh, fun sport team names, especially singular names. Good ones in the USL that Sarah found. If you want that wider conversation, get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple added support for lossless and spatial audio features to Apple Music on Android. The update also includes a new automatic crossfade feature. So enjoy Lord's new single, Spatially. Yes, on your Galaxy phone. Uh, IDOS, uh, later IDOS 2, is an iOS app that emulates DOS, like you would have guessed, and has been available in the App Store since 2010, becoming IDOS 2 in 2014. The latest update was not approved because it executes IDOS package and image files, which it's done for a while, but I guess Apple just noticed. Apple does not allow apps to bring in executable code as a defense against malware and piracy. Perhaps IDOS should just make a progressive web app instead. Facebook's doing that. They're the latest, bringing their cloud gaming service to iOS with a web app at facebook.com slash gaming slash play. Google Drive will now allow users to block other accounts from sharing files with them designed to prevent potential harassment and spam, also preventing accounts from accessing any files that you have shared with blocked accounts in the past, plus removing any of their past files from your drive. Corning announced it's bringing Gorilla Glass with DX and Gorilla Glass with DX Plus to smartphone camera lenses, having offered the glass composites on smartwatches since 2018. So, you know, they're figuring out how to make them bigger at cost. Corning says it offers typical Gorilla Glass scratch resistance while letting in 98% of ambient light compared to 95% of light let through by traditional anti-reflective coatings. The IT management software company Kaseya announced that it obtained a universal decryptor from a third party for the Revol ransomware that was distributed to its customers following a supply chain attack earlier this month. The company said it couldn't confirm or deny it paid a ransom. Revol, Dark Web, and Clear websites went dark following the attack. All right, let's talk a little bit about robots. Alphabet announced a new company called Intrinsic that will focus on providing software that makes robots easier to use, more flexible, and more affordable. This is one of those alphabet companies that starts in the moonshot factory and spins out to become its own thing once they think it's viable. The company's been testing automated perception, motion planning, and reinforcement learning. The intrinsic team trained a robot in two hours to make a USB connection. You may say, well, I, I can do it faster, but that's something that would normally take hundreds of hours of coding. So two hours is pretty good for training a robot. Also taught robot arms to build furniture. Uh, the impressive part really isn't the what though, it's the ability to make it easy for companies without their own robotics scientists to implement this. You don't know, have to know how to program it. It just comes with the ability to learn. You can show off stuff. Intrinsic hopes to partner with healthcare, electronics, and auto manufacturing companies and will be headed by Wendy Tan White, who has served as VP of Alphabet's X Moonshot Factory since 2019 and previously worked on software as a service to make web development more accessible. So this uh, Patrick, is kind of... Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, Patrick knows somebody who I think would be very excited at this product if I, it works I, as advertised. I literally forwarded this to a friend of mine who spent a big chunk of the last year and a half programming robotic arms to move things in and out of CNC mills and to create this process to speed up their production. Uh, and, uh, you know, if this works, it 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 means it makes it. Yes. Good. I want it to work. Please work. Please, please work. Please don't kill it just as it gets interesting. Um not that I, I get sad about Google killing interesting things. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, in a previous life, this would have been a Google X company, right? The idea right. that that Alphabet now, as as the you know umbrella company for everything Google, saying we have enough of this robotic stuff that we want to make our own arm, and this is this is the new brand. Intrinsic is the brand that this is going under. Is uh, is I don't know. A significant I mean, commitment. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, it says good things for for uh, uh, stuff ahead. 
Yeah, uh, Wendy Tan White wrote in a blog post about this that they want to give robots the ability to sense, learn, and automatically make adjustments as they're completing tasks so they can work in a wider range of settings and applications. That's what we're talking about. But also wrote, none of this is realistic or affordable to automate today. This all hints at the potential for intrinsic software to radically reduce the time, cost, and complexity required to use industrial robots. So that implies that they're like, everybody thinks this is impossible, but we think we figured it out. It's also, I think, gives more points towards putting Google in the race to be Skynet. Um, well, Alphabet, well, not well, Google. Well, and well, also Alphabet taken. saying, everything we're doing is years off. So, yeah. you know, if we don't have a win in the next couple of years, don't worry, we're working on it, you know? That kind of thing, it, it, that, that also matters. This is Alphabet doing what it was supposed to do, which is right. allow the X projects space outside of Google and Google's focus on bottom line to spread their wings. Sometimes they work uh, like Waymo, sometimes they don't like Loon. Mm. Well, let's talk about food, shall we? Uh, specifically groceries, <laughs> online grocery options ever, ever a changing. So here are a couple of new developments to be aware of. Over the next 12 months, Instacart and its technology partner Fabric plan to begin building warehouses for supermarkets that will use robots to gather items and Instacart's workers to pack and deliver orders. Fulfillment centers uh, like this will keep stock and delivery shoppers out of store space. So it's, you know, kind of putting everything over, you know, in, in one area and generally cut costs enough to be profitable within a year of operations. Sounds pretty good. Instacart not alone here, though. Albertsons and Spartan Nash are also building their own warehouses for online orders at their stores. And Albertsons has partnered with Uber and DoorDash on grocery delivery in the past and, and currently as well. There are operations that are warehouse only, like SoftBank-owned Puff, also another company called We, which does the same. But what about you as a shopper? Yeah, what about me? Yeah, exactly. Is anybody putting together some technology to help you on your end and make your life easier? Actually, Tom, the answer is yes. Thank goodness. <laughs> TechCrunch wrote an article about a German startup called Kitchenful that wants to help you with the meal planning end of things. So when with Kitchenful, you choose your type of diet, any restrictions that you might have, low calorie options, gluten, nut allergies, that sort of thing. And it creates meal plan for you each week. You can review and customize the meals once they're approved, and Kitchenful then creates a grocery order at a partner supermarket near you. Kitchenful makes a little money off of you, of course they wouldn't do it otherwise, for paying for the meal and recipe planning, and a little off the supermarkets for sending customers their way. So everybody gets a little bit of a cut here. If you're asking, do they have any decent grocery stores? Well, it depends on where you live. So far, Kitchenful has partnerships with REW in Germany and Walmart and Kroger in the U.S., uh, in the U.S., that's going to cover a pretty large swath of folks who have grocery stores near them. All of this points to a future where your grocery concierge plans your meals and orders your groceries and a robot packs it all up for delivery and sends it to your door. Oh, my gosh. That sounds amazing. It does. I know. I I, I want this. I, I want kitchen full to be really good. I don't know if it is, but I want it to be really good at saying, yeah, we know what you like. We know you're trying to keep, you know, your calorie count down here. We know that your wife doesn't like this kind of food. You don't like that kind of food. Here's a meal plan for you to approve. You go through and you're like, nope, actually uh, get rid of that one and put in spaghetti and meatballs. Perfect. And then it just orders the groceries for me. They show up at my house and I've got the recipes and everything I need for the week. That's great. I love that idea. I feel like we've been getting, you know, there's so many, um, uh, not grocery, well, yes, grocery delivery meal options services. exist, but also, yes, meal services, exactly. You know, I'm thinking of like Blue Plate or whatever, um, or Blue Apron, um, where there's a little bit of a barrier to entry. You know, if you're not much of a cook, then you might say, well, this is pretty great, but I'm not going to end up cooking all these meals. And, you know, some of it doesn't apply to me. Maybe some of it doesn't appeal to me, all that stuff. Kitchen full sounds like the sweet spot that many of us have been looking for. And Tom, you mentioned something like, oh, my wife doesn't like this sort of food. It almost like a mattress, right? Like if kitchen full could be good at saying, well, so here's a meal plan where everyone's happy <laughs> on either side of the, you know, the dinner table. Then, then it becomes pretty smart. Kitchen full, saving relationships. 
one <laughs> meal at a time. Yeah, I mean, I love the Tavala meals I get because the, I can order some lower calorie items that are enjoyable and still I feel like I've eaten a meal. They're easy to prepare, uh, but I only do a few of those a week. Uh, and, and the rest of the time I either, we have to go order out or, or go out or make it ourselves. Uh, and, and we've got some good meals that we make ourselves on the regular, but, you know, varying it up and having the ability to, to try some new things and work some other recipes in there. I guess where this would break down is when we do like, no, 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 we want to do this Korean, you know, uh, kimchi jong uh, that I saw. Can you put in your own recipe? Can you can you modify it easily mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, to include your own stuff in there? Because if you can, then even better. Yeah, I I mean I I I I plan and cook for one currently, and I'm pretty you know I kind of tend to buy the same things week after week. Sometimes I go a little crazy, but I have my staples. Something like Kitchenful to say I know what your staples are, and here's where we can you know give it a little flair here or there. That would be great. That is something that I'm looking for, and you know again, at least in the U.S., partnering with Walmart and Kroger um, is. That's uh, I, That's a I would start. love to know if yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a it's a pretty big start, and if yeah. anyone's using it and likes it, let us know. At the end of June, Mark Zuckerberg told Facebook staff the company was committed to creating the metaverse. I'm not joking; those were literally his words. Uh, the word metaverse is, is usually an allusion to Neil Stevenson's book Snow Crash, uh, where people can coexist in a virtual world that melds with our own. Zuckerberg said that all Facebook divisions who work with communities, creators, commerce, VR, would contribute to the goal, saying, "Quote." Our overarching goal across all of these initiatives is to help bring the metaverse to life. So what does he mean by metaverse? Well, in the interview that he gave, he cited VC Matthew Ball, who defined it in a popular essay back in January 2020 as four main things, spanning physical and virtual worlds, so augmented reality, containing its own fully fledged economy, so you, you don't have to cash out to, to work inside of it, Fully interoperable, I'm going to return to this one, no matter which platform you use to access it, it works. You have to be able to take your avatar and your goods with you if you switch platforms and still be able to see everybody else or it's not a metaverse. And run by no single company, which is like the internet. Uh -oh. No one company <laughs> runs the internet. So the metaverse would be a kind of internet. The Verge's Casey Newton talked to Zuckerberg about that presentation. They discussed the things you might expect, 3D concerts, the infinite office where VR lets you have as many screens as, as you want. Zuckerberg admitted that VR headsets are a bit clunky now, but he thinks they'll get there. And on the way, the metaverse will be, quote, accessible across different computing platforms. So you'll be able to get to it on your phone or your laptop on the way to having better gear to access. And of course... I'll throw in there, you can add, uh, gather a lot more data about people in VR, like how they're standing, what they're looking <laughs> at, for how long. Zuckerberg didn't talk as much about that, saying only, quote, no. there will be privacy questions and there will be intellectual property questions. <laughs> but on interoperability, Zuckerberg said he really hopes it's all going to be interoperable. That's what he believes it should be. But he warned, and I quote, I think sometimes people may be a little idealistic about assuming that this will develop in a certain way. You're going to have some companies that are trying to build incredibly siloed things, and then some that are trying to build more open and interoperable ones. Oh, which boy. makes me wonder, which one will Facebook choose to be, Mark? <laughs> I, I, okay, I mean, I, uh, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Patrick. <laughs> I was going to say, it's like, like one, I, I think you have to give a shout out to Neil Stevenson um, for coining the idea of the metaverse, uh, much like uh, William Gibson coined the phrase cyberspace, uh, you know, and ironically in the metaverse in uh, Snow Crash, the novel it was pulled out of, the 1992 novel was pulled out of, you know, the, the metaverse was basically owned by one company. Um, and it was, you know, you strapped on goggles and, you know, you had this immersive experience and somewhere at the perfect version of this, you know, is putting a jack in the back of your neck, um, you know, or trodes on your head and having a fully immersive, you know, cut out neural cut out that allows you to experience things uh in a truly virtual environment but you know i've been joking literally since um um since uh facebook bought oculus that you know it was all about you know taking the next step towards virtual makeouts and securing generations of teens 
uh, want to experience life through Facebook. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you know, it's it's cute to see Mark talk about open environments. And, and, and I almost, I tried not to burst out laughing when you talked about how the internet is not run by any one company, because it's not, but we've managed to contain so much of the interaction in a couple of different platforms, pound Facebook. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious, like what it ends up being and how, how deeply tied into Facebook it is. Um, it's yeah, also kind of with you on that one, on his part, because he's basically saying like, this is the future. This is what we're doing. And it's almost like, he's asking I, I think Wall that's Street fascinating mission. that he's yeah. looking at Facebook and realizing, uh, if they keep going the way it is now, there's an end. Right there's a there's a place where it just doesn't grow anymore uh, and starts to get old and people move on and and so it's smart to be looking at where can the technology take us and how can we take the things we've learned as a company to do well and create the next thing and get ahead of it and I think that's really smart. Yeah, I'm sitting here pointing at at the the cameras are saying that because you know if everything happens and there you know the, your life is if the government forces Facebook to make your online life portable so that people can interact outside of Facebook the way they've been kind of locked into interacting in Facebook you know they can create a they can create a a a, a barrier to entry outside of Facebook because you know things just work better when you have Oculus and Facebook and you can use that third party headset but hey you're going to have to sort out the problems because that's their headset not ours kind of a feel um I mean, on the cynical? subject of VR, <laughs> just because, I mean, it is cynical, but I mean, you should be cynical when it comes to Facebook. But I mean, I, I am a VR, I mean, over the last year, in fact, I I just got like my one year, like Supernatural was like, hey, you've been a member for a year. I was like, okay. So I've had my Oculus for just over a year now. I mean, I am such a convert, but I also find it to be like borderline dangerous because you put it on and you're like right. new world real world no longer exists new world and i get where this metaverse could thrive in that sort of situation right. where sure facebook was a screen and you see you know there's a feed and you see updates from people and yeah we're we're kind of one step into this verse of sorts something where it's truly immersive and i don't right. really know how that you know, how, how Facebook becomes that thing, especially if Facebook's like, oh, it's not just one company, you know, it's a whole metaverse <laughs> type of thing. Like a lot of questions still to be answered, but it it is the general progression of all right. of this. Or at least so. the one that science fiction has been pumping us for. Have you read Ready Player Two yet? Uh, no. There are thoughts about okay. this whole all emerging right. concept and area. Um, Very good. Yeah. I'll just... I'll just leave I know. it there. I just, no yeah. spoilers. I haven't read it. <laughs> no spoilers. That's as much as I can say without having someone hating me. Uh, <laughs> well, before we move on, you may be wondering about Twitter's role in the future metaverse. What are its plans? Well, those of you wondering, CEO Jack Dorsey told Twitter investors Thursday that Bitcoin will be a, quote, big part of the company's future. So, hey, the metaverse needs an economy, Jack. Yeah. There you go. Uh, you, know, you happen to be the CEO of Square. That works out nicely. Uh, in the fourth and final installment of our Seniors in Tech mini podcast series, Dr. Nikki Ackermans will introduce us to Dr. Ruth Ports, whose career includes running IT for multiple particle accelerator and physical la uh, physics labs, rather, and developing uh, the World Wide Web. Just a little thing she did in her off time. Pretty cool stuff. It all drops this Saturday, July 24th in the DTNS feed. Do not miss it. <laughs> On Wednesday, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission voted to increase its enforcement of laws against repair restrictions that prevent small businesses, workers, consumers, and even government entities from fixing their own products. The FTC said specifically it will target repair restrictions that violate antitrust laws enforced by the FTC or the FTC Act's prohibitions on unfair or deceptive acts or practices. The commission also urged the public to submit complaints of violations of the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, which prohibits, among other things, tying a consumer's product warranty to the use of a specific service provider or product. Patrick, I know you've been you've been following the story. I have feelings. You're <laughs> you're familiar with the fight the fight for the right to repair controversy. So, what is your take at this point? I'm delighted um, because when, first of all, I'm delighted, number one, because everyone voted 
uh, for this. And 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 the FTC commissioners are a mixture of Republicans and Democrats. And and anytime they all vote, you for you mean the the FT, all the FTC commissioners voted unanimously for something? Yes. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I you he, yeah. when he's when you said everyone voted, I was like, oh, you mean the people? No, no. The FTC commissioners no, 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 no. all agreed on something. That is significant. You're right. Yeah. I mean, unless I unless I misread. Uh, no, I think you're right. Stories it was kind of through. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just like that's what, what? that's un, what you you know is what the, how long has it been since that happened? Um, but uh, this is this is a big deal, right? Because um, the FTC is has basically said, "Oh, look, we have a stick. We don't know who we're going to hit with the stick. We don't know where we're going to hit them with the stick. But you guys may remember we have a big stick, and we would like you to play nicer with consumers. Um, and this is right. This goes back. The FTC uh, put a report in front of Congress, and I think the best line from you know the the best kind of line to come out of that whole study was there is scant evidence to support manufacturers' justifications for repair restrictions. You know, because it's always. It's always, it's for security. It's for the children. It's because people can't figure out how to do things. It's because we don't want third parties to do that. And part of the problem here is that all of this has been battled out in the automotive industry decades ago. And every other industry wants to be like, no, 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 no. Our, our products are, are too complex or our standards are too high or, or security. Um, and it's also really funny when companies that have a pathetic security history are trying to use the threat of security issues for justifying not allowing people to fix things with third parties or fix or, them. Or intellectual property doing the same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's there's a lot going on here, right? So there was a there was an executive order uh, signed by the president, and you know, like a week, two weeks later, uh, the FTC makes a big statement. And you know, it's crazy. This is you know literally days, maybe not, probably not, I guess it was probably a month after the, the new commissioner was sworn, but um, they, they used big, heavy words, um, you know, restricting consumers and businesses from choosing how they repair products can substantially increase the total cost of repairs, generate harmful electronic waste, and unnecessarily increase wait times for repairs. In contrast, providing more choice in repairs can lead to lower costs, reduce e-waste by extending the useful lifespan of products, enable more timely repairs, and provide economic opportunities for entrepreneurs and local businesses. This is a big deal for me because, for example, in my home state, my current home state of Missouri, um, the agricultural lobbyists, i.e. the farmers who pay a lot of taxes and have a huge representation in the state, have been able to get right to repair bills, keep them alive uh, in, 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 our, uh, in our legislature, where the consumer electronics ones have just been sort of filed off into a committee to go die. Be, you know, because you know, this, is, this is, and so that's really frustrating because, you know, I, I, I get having political power. I also get the idea that if you don't harvest the corn because your tractor's broken because you have to wait two days for John Deere uh, to send out a licensed technician or your local John Deere dealer to do that, you know, it, it wipes you out financially. That said, uh, there's a lot of things that, where it could be much easier to repair things and keep them out of landfills and make life less expensive if uh, other organizations work together. I've also heard some people have made some some fair arguments discussing like, well, you know, there are issues with, you know, the quality of repairs or, the, you know, the, the cost of making parts available. And all of this will kind of sort itself out over time. I'm just delighted because so many of these fights at the state level are a case where massive companies with huge budgets that want to keep things expensive and difficult to repair – so that either their dealers or the company themselves gets the money out of it, or they just people are kind of forced to buy new things, are now in a position where they're actually being told, "You need to make this easier. You need yeah. to make this simpler." Um, and the best part about this is saying is not saying we need new laws. It's saying yeah. we just need to enforce the ones we got. The Magnuson uh, Act says that vague terms in a warranty are construed against the drafter. That's not the way yeah. it has been going in practice. Warranters no. cannot require branded parts. Uh, that one gets violated all the time. And warranters yeah. cannot decline coverage because a previous unrelated repair was attempted. In yeah. other words, that sticker that says if you try to open this, you void your warranty. No, you don't. Uh, the law says you can open your electronics without voiding the entire warranty, even if a sticker implies otherwise. So yeah. this is them finally saying we're going to enforce that. Tell us if anybody's abusing it. We'll go after them. They got, they're going to use that stick.
So I'm, I, I'm, I think this is a wonderful step in the right direction. This is also, you know, this is laying down a gauntlet by the FTC, and they're basically, you know, politely suggesting that lots of organizations step up and make things easier for consumers. And, you know, now it's time to see what the response is and what the next step is. Uh, this is a long game of chess, but this was a huge move on the chessboard. Yeah, two spaces. It's like an open <laughs> Security reporter Kim Zetter's Zero Day newsletter has an excellent breakdown of what the NSO surveillance list is and is not. To catch you up, NSO Group makes spyware called Pegasus. It's sold to governments and law enforcement agencies for spying on whoever their clients define as criminals. DTNS covered the tech of this earlier this week, but lots of other outlets ran with the more sensational part of the story, which is a 50,000 phone number list. And that list includes phone numbers for several heads of state, journalists, CEOs, other big names like that. Media outlets working with Forbidden Stories identified about a thousand of those numbers, the people behind about a thousand of those numbers, and was able to do forensic analysis on 67 phones and found evidence of Pegasus infection on 23 of them, with a further 14 showing an attempt at infection. In other words, a text message was sent, but the phone wasn't vulnerable to the vulnerability. That's 0.07% with at least an attempted infection that they found of the 50,000. Could be more, but that they found it's an incredibly low percentage. NSO Group denies knowing anything about this list. They say, we don't even know where that would come from, who it would be from. So what is it? Zetter says one of the best possibilities is a database from an HLR lookup service. HLR stands for Home Location Register. It's a service that can verify if a phone is on and what region it's operating in. Now, before you say that sounds creepy, that would normally be done by a business wanting to send an SMS, maybe a marketing message or something, and you only want to pay to send messages to active phones in the area you're doing business. You're an LA car dealer, uh, and you want to make sure those those phones are legit on, they're, they're not canceled accounts, and they're in yeah. LA. And it's relevant. Yeah. Uh, however, HLRs can also be used in surveillance to make sure that the target you're sending your spyware to gets it. So someone with access to an HLR company's database could have queried countries that are known to conduct surveillance in a phishing expedition to collect a list that would inevitably have a few numbers that were targeted by users of Pegasus, like maybe with a success rate of 0.07%, perhaps. <laughs> it's not zero. So that would mean that the list was meant to expose NSO Group's target, but it wouldn't have had to come to, from NSO Group. I got nothing. I mean, <laughs> what, what a, the, the story is, I mean, it's it's vast and continues to unfold. Um, it's been interesting to hear NSO group saying, but I mean, we, we just, we, we, it wasn't us. We've done nothing here. Well, and it wouldn't have had to be. That's what this is saying is, exactly. is somebody, somebody created this list in order to embarrass NSO group or expose NSO groups practices, which have been well covered, but haven't got the amount of attention they've gotten this week, certainly. Uh, and, and that list wouldn't have needed to have come directly from NSO group. I, I think my favorite comment on this, and I, I apologize because I can't find the security professional I follow that tweeted about this, but they were like, well, the reason that, you know, the U.S. and the Russians aren't on this list is because they have their own homegrown internal systems that are way better than anything NSO can sell. Uh, you know, and the other one that was so great was somebody, I think it was NSO was, was making their version of the, the hammer argument. You can hammer a nail, you can hammer a human skull, we just sell hammers. You know, that's what people choose to do with our beautiful, well, beautiful hammers. Arguments. Um, well, and they do. No, I mean, I, I, I'll give them that. They only sell their very dangerous hammers to certain people. They don't sell it to everybody. It could be worse, right? They could be out on the black market selling this to any Tom, Dick, or Harry that comes along. They don't. I'm not excusing what they do, right. but that is true. Uh, now, certain governments can, could define criminal at differently than other governments, and, and whether it's ethical to sell them the hammer or not is a whole different situation. Well, if you're planning on getting on an airplane soon, you're not alone. A lot of people are. And Chris Christensen is back with a tip for an airline's app to snag before you hit any airport snags. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. If you're going to be flying domestically in the United States at least, you're definitely going to want to have the app 
for the airline on your smartphone before you get on the plane. There's a couple reasons for that. Some of them, like United, you can use some of the onboard entertainment through your phone or through your tablet or whatever device you have. And so that's useful. But all three major airlines in the U.S., United, Delta, and American, all are doing contactless sales, if they're selling you a meal on the flight, they are no longer going to be selling it to you using even a credit card. You've got to be paying for it with the app. So you have to have the app and you have to have your credit card in the app so that it knows about you if you want to purchase something on the flight. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Put the app on the internal server that serves your Wi-Fi. Some, some airlines do that and I commend them, but come on. Like, make it easy for people to get your app so they can spend their money, for goodness sake. Yeah, right. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, this one comes from Mad Geek. This was actually a tweet in response to our Daily Tech News Show uh, Twitter account um, from our Wednesday show with Scott Johnson. Mad Geek says, quick feedback on Netflix. I think AR, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Netflix gaming is what Mad, Ge Mad Geek is uh, referencing. Mad Geek says, I think AR might be well in the cards if building games off of IP pointing a phone camera at a screen and seeing what shows up. If you need a camera to identify one of four possible screens, for example, easier to do a, who's that? Sort of a trivia, a trivial pursuit game or Jackbox type games. He also I says, sorry for I... brief points, but this is just Twitter. Yes, Mad Geek, we get <laughs> it. And, and uh, we appreciate your lead speak. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love I love Mad Geek's uh, take on this, which is it makes perfect sense to give an AR game that you play with your phone while you're watching Netflix on your TV, right? And it becomes a companion game, not just something you play yeah. later to extend the experience. I love that. Yeah, I know. We keep trying to come up with ways where this is going to make sense for Netflix going forward. Pat, do you have thoughts? I I I I, I feel like every ten years or so. A couple of things happen, one of which, and, and YouTube was talking about this, you know, last week, how they're going to allow people to one click order from certain YouTube channels at this point, you know, because mm -hmm. I remember when people were doing that 20 years ago or trying to do that on satellite uh, television systems uh, to I just I just want to pay attention to my delete expletive show. Uh, and I can see where you could create something. You don't where the, have the phone to is not. I know, but they're going to do something where I have to use the game to get some pivotal plot point. Um, oh, if they it's do that, idea. they'll upset so many yeah, people. I, don't, I, I doubt they would. Okay. Can you imagine being like, do you want to know what happens at the end of Ted Lasso? Play this game. <laughs> no, do not do that. <laughs> get your torch, Sarah. We're marching on whoever's house made that decision. <laughs> it's true. I know. I, I really, I'm, I'm curious. For everyone. Than it's true. It's true. Also, if, if you, if you have. Happy Lasso day. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That's what I'm doing my Friday night. Yay, sushi for all. Uh, if you have uh, ideas, feedback, questions, comments, anything that we talk about on the show, we'd love to hear it. Really helps us out. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Mike McLaughlin, Miss Music Teacher, and James C. Smith. And guess what? We got a couple new brand new bosses, uh, Robert L. Rashida and Russell Tachera. Both started backing us on Patreon. Robert and Russell, you are Robert. the Friday champs. Robert and Russell are our new most favorite people uh, yeah. for, for joining the rest of our most favorite people who are our patrons. Thank you, Robert and Russell. You guys are the best. Yeah, Robert and Russell, if you happen to be watching Ted Lasso later today, consider us hugging you during that Maybe playing darts. I don't know. Uh, your choice. Yay. Also, also thanks to Patrick Martin for being with us today. Patrick, where can people keep up with everything that you do? Oh, uh, just go to twitter.com slash Patrick Norton or please, please, please subscribe to uh, AVXL at AVXL.com, which is the podcast on home theater and audio I host with Mr. Robert Heron. Oh, and it's a good one, too. Anything AV related, you cannot miss it. Folks, we are live Monday through Friday on this very show. 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC is when we are live. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tom's working on Know a Little More on Monday. We will be back with Rich. Hope you have a great weekend. Talk to you soon. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. 
video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz, associate producer Anthony Lemos, Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos, news host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter, science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans, social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding, our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one, BioCal, Captain Kipper, Jack Shid, Steve Rama, Paul Reese, and Matthew J. Stevenson. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, Creative Vast Arts, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon ad support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Patrick Norton. Guest on this week's show was Andrew Heaton. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>